Welcome to Mentoring Moments. Mentoring Moments is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast. It is composed of clips taken from Jason's one-to-one and group mentorship sessions. Welcome to the E-Commerce Edge podcast. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Ishveen Jolly from Open Sponsorship. Welcome, Ishveen. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to finally be able to catch up and have this conversation. I think the last time you were stuck in a cafe somewhere when we tried to have our catch up and a little bit noisy in the background. And so we decided, hey, look, let's defer this to another time. So you're in a very quiet, private spot now. So really looking forward to having a, a really insightful conversation with you today about all things influencer marketing and the pl- amazing platform you've built. But before we get into that and the nitty gritty, how did you come to even be in this space? Like what's your elevator pit? What pitch? What's your founder's story of how you got dragged kicking and screaming into this wonderful world of e-commerce, digital, influencer marketing, etc. Yeah. You'll laugh because we were actually exchanging uh, stories around is marketing good or bad. But when I background quickly, I had played sports all my life and it was like a massive part of who I was. And then graduated, I was a management consultant and I felt this calling to work in sport. Didn't really know what I was going to do. So I fell into sponsorship. Didn't really have an interest in marketing, but fell in love with like sponsorship as a form of marketing. I was addicted to deal making. I thought it was really cool. Literally like money can't buy experiences that you can buy is what I would call sponsorship. Um, And so fast forward, I thought the deal making side was really tough and not very logical and having been a management consultant where it's like spreadsheets and logic and data and it was just gosh it's been a while it was like 2015 around 2014 2015 and the rise of uber in new york and like platforms like ZocDoc and Airbnb. And I was like, wait, why is our industry so antiquated? And so very naively set out to create the, what I used to call the Airbnb of sports sponsorship. And it's funny, Jason, you say influencer marketing, because I'd literally say for the first three years of having open sponsorship, people used to say influencer marketing. And I was like, don't use that word to me. Don't use that term to me. Like we are sponsorship. It's a little bit like anyone who supports like uh, this cricket analogy which is probably bad for the audience but like anyone that supports a, a true form of it's people like who love tennis who are like what are you talking about what's this pickleball or paddle or whatever else no tennis is the real thing and or basketball where it's like people talking about three on three or whatever else and so i found influencer marketing quite jarring at the beginning but then i listened to the market and i was like actually we're influencer marketing within the sports space so that's how we got here yeah and i can't through my uneducated mind and i don't work in your space so my a novice mind about if I look at somebody like Michael Jordan example, when we think about the Jordan range of shoes, which he's a sponsored sponsored player, was sponsored player, but still the Jordan range still today reigns supreme. It sold billions and billions of dollars worth of basketball shoes and sports shoes in general. And now it's become a lifestyle product. After once he retired, then it became more of a lifestyle product than a sports product. And you can't say that he didn't influence billions of dollars worth of product sales. He absolutely did. And so whether you call it a sponsorship or whether you call it an influencer marketing initiative, the reality is kids every single day have been influenced to buy a pair of Jordans because of Michael Jordan and because of his success in sports and his leadership in sports. So I guess you, you almost can't have one without the other because at the end of the day, if someone hasn't been successful in their area of endeavor and they haven't stood out and they haven't been a leader and they, then they don't have the capability to influence the buying decisions of anyone. And so the reality is that they, it feels like they are kissing cousins in a way, this whole sports sponsorship thing combined with influencer marketing. It is perhaps one of the most powerful forms of influencer marketing where today a lot of influencers are famous just for being famous whereas it feels like sports influencers Mm. they have a reason for their influence beyond just they've been able to turn themselves into a socialite 100 percent, and i think exactly that and i think that's why it was tough at the beginning coming from that sports background whereas that's reality tv stars are influencers we're athletes but actually the reason why it is so intertwined in cousins or basically the same is because social media is so pervasive now that even if you do a full on sponsorship deal, 90% of the impact of that deal is going to be through social. 
not TV, not billboards, not radio, nothing else. And so I think it was that realization that, oh, it's not really about the the terminology. It's about the channel. And influencer marketing is a social media first channel and sponsorship traditionally wasn't. And actually, it does make sense to be a social media first channel, even if you do work with athletes. And as I understand it, and again, I, look, I just in all transparency, I've never worked with your platform before, but as I understand it, and as I read from your website, one of the goals behind you creating this platform was we know that somebody like a Jordan or somebody who's the top one, two, three, four, or five in their chosen sport, they're going to have agents. They're going to they're going to have all of the infrastructure around them to go out and get them the best deals with the best sponsors. And they're going to they're going to be working with the Nikes and the Adidas's of the world. They're going to be working with these multi billion dollar global brands. But once you get down below that top one, two, three, four, five percent of athletes, there are athletes that are still incredibly good at their sport, are incredibly powerful in their brand perception. They're incredibly respected in their vertical, in their industry. And they oftentimes have significant social, well, even if they're not the number one in their sport, they oftentimes still have significant social followings and significant influence. And as I understand it, one of the goals behind setting up what you did was to make, was to democratize access to these athletes that aren't in the top one, two, three, four, or five, but also democratize access to brands by these athletes that don't have all of this incredible infrastructure around them like the top, the very, very top athletes do. And so it, it feels like you were trying to, I don't know, it, it feels, make this more accessible for both the athletes and the brands and, and create a conduit where those two could connect in a meaningful way outside of the machine that is sports marketing and agencies, et cetera. 100% is exactly that. And the main reason why, again, going back to why we now say we are influencer marketing is because social, what, like you're saying, what social media did was it gave everyone a voice. It didn't, you didn't have to be that top 5%. And there is still the biggest brands who can afford the Tom Brady's or the David Beckham's or the Steph Curry's go for it. But a lot of people can't afford it, as you said. The other thing is, arguably, is your money best better spent taking for the same amount of money 40 mid-level people? And that's probably what the and so in this world where I think sports sponsorship has really had its like reckoning when it came to ROI. And what what like D to C and what Google and Facebook they all did was they're like, this is the number. You spend a hundred K with us, this is what you got back. And it's like sponsorship was always like but you got tickets to a game and like your CEO got to hang out with our CEO. And, and so I think when we came into the market, we were like, frankly, what happened was I thought we were like, as I said, Airbnb and we were doing these matches and then clients would leave us. And we were like, why are you leaving? We did the match. And they're like, yeah, but we didn't get an ROI. And I was like, ROI? I don't, what? Like, why do I need to show you ROI? And they were like, I could put this money elsewhere and get an ROI. And so a lot of it came down to, if you're going to judge us by the money we spend, then that's where that mid-tier is really valuable. And it's like the drop in price between Serena Williams, we love her, is one of our investors, but the drop in price between her and her sister Venus is huge. And of course, the influence difference is huge as well, but there's a lot of brands who could pay for Venus, but don't think about it. But we're like, do these deals with people in the middle? Yeah, I guess we call it the fat middle in the sense that there's only a few people at the very pinnacle of these sports. If we look at tennis, there's Nole and there's Alcaraz and there's Sinner and there's a couple, the younger generation, then Nole's the older generation. And there's there's literally a handful. You can count them on two hands yeah. or less, the people that are at the absolute pinnacle of their sport and are known in every nook and cranny globally, they're on TV, they're on radio, they're on social, they're, they're literally ubiquitous in their presence and in their reach. But there are many other people, as you rightly point out, who are still major players in their sport that are well known within their sport, within that industry, and still have significant amounts of influence. And as you rightly say, I think in some respects, some of those middle tier people, and I'm thinking of people like Cam Haynes 
who's an influencer in the archery space. And there's a few other people who never set out to, to turn pro, so to speak, necessarily. That wasn't their goal. They had a passion for their sport is also their hobby. It's their lifestyle. They live it. They breathe it. They eat it. They sleep it. And yes, some of these professional athletes, they're making a living off of their sport, but they're it's truly a passion for them. And if they never make it to number one in their sport, they're okay with that because they're living their dream. They're living their passion. They're able to make a living doing something that they absolutely love. And if and, and, they, and they're still able to make a very good living at it, even if they aren't number one in their sport. And in some respects, it makes them more accessible for the types of customers that those brands mm-hmm. are courting. Because somebody might say, I know I'm never going to be of yeah. Venus Williams, but maybe I can be my local tennis club pro, or I can be my regional, I, I can be a regional t- top of my region or the top of my state or whatever it might be. It, it, it somehow those middle tier sports stars feel more accessible to your average everyday punter in a given sport or in a given activity or in a given hobby Somehow they seem more accessible. They seem more human. They seem more normal. And therefore, in some respects, their influence is more powerful than someone who's literally top 1% in the world. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, especially when you think about when marketers who they want to go regional, so often that college athlete or like the NFL player in Buffalo is definitely the most famous person there. Also, when you think about like niches, so, you know, if you're a pet brand, you need people who have pets who talk about their pets and that might not be the biggest star in fact it probably or there's a few of them but so i think we do again in this world of influencer marketing authenticity is key and so it's more important to have a story alignment whether they're top middle or bottom and that is that's what again we have a great social listening tool so we can pull out and say okay who's talked about financial literacy who's talked about biohacking who's talked about whatever it may be and that's a great way to, to create those matches and you say specifically you say that this we're more than influencer marketing software we, we want to power your next sports and entertainment marketing campaign and basically you don't just work with athletes you're also working with music artists content creators teams big activities and events. So you it feels like open sponsorship is this really unique crossover between the traditional PR world, right? The traditional sports marketing world and the traditional influencer marketing world. It's, I don't know, this weird technically driven mashup of all three of those industries. Yeah, no, I definitely. And then to further complicate matters, we started off pure marketplace, self-service, sign up and all of that. And then about three years ago, we had a movement around like hashtag, like not another login is what we call it, where people were like, look, we love the fact that you've got the tech, but we don't have time to learn another platform. We don't have the resource. And in fact, we'd rather have a human being help us out with this. And so we called it like many tech platforms, we called it account management. And then you take a look back and you're like, "Hmm, we've essentially gone from being a tech platform to a tech enabled agency. And so I think that's also really interesting is like that movement, which is, I think we're almost going that anti-tech era where people are like, give me a human to help me do my job versus giving me a tool, which I have to learn everything about. And you've specialized historically in college, university athletes, and then obviously pro and semi-pro athletes at at different tiers. One of the things that I've wondered is when do we start getting high school athletes involved Mm -hmm. in this world? Because from what I can see happening out there, there are a lot of athletes that are starting, maybe they're in their, maybe they're in their junior year or their freshman year of high school, but they're already starting to show significant talent. They already know how to work social media. They've already got big social media followings and maybe via their parents, obviously they they wouldn't necessarily be able to engage with your platform directly themselves. But at that age, kind of their parents are their agents, so to speak. And they're the ones that are promoting them. They're the ones that are pushing them. And we know that a lot of those semi-pro high school athletes, they're likely to go on to be college and university level semi-pro athletes and then they're likely to go on from that that at least the top percentage of those are likely to go out into the pro or semi-pro world post university and so do you think that's like getting them young so to speak 
is one of the opportunities to to bring them into your world and democratize access to that level of athlete? Yeah, going back to what you said, it's all about influence, right? So if these youth kids have influence over other youths, then they are obviously a great fit. And so we've definitely already been asked about, do we have youth? We have like limits on sign up based on follower size, but not necessarily based on age, which I'm not sure is okay or not. But and as you said, it's often the parents. So we get a lot of DMs from parents who are like, my kid is. So I'd say like the beauty again of what we've built with the platform is it's really up to the brands. So for example, right now, our brands are asking for, they like athletes, but they also want like biohackers. Like big, and a few months ago, it was pickleball, which are athletes, but they're not pro athletes. And so I'd say like, when we hear brands talk more about a certain sector, we tend to go after that. So youth has come up, but it's, I think, again, probably legalities companies are a bit worried about giving money to youth and what happens or whatever else. So I think like, with and if we have enough requests right now, it's like, we're very close, but not quite. Yeah, I, I, I could just see a world where that's going to become like the norm because the the kids of today, they know how to work social to their benefit, unlike any other generation before them. The reality is they have outsized influence if they can build up that following on social. And who doesn't want to be a YouTuber? Who doesn't want to be a, an Instagram star? Who you know Nowadays, if you ask most high school kids what they'd like to do for a living, it's like, I'd love to be a YouTuber. I'd love to be an Instagram star. I'd love yeah. to be a social media influencer. So uh, I could definitely see that coming down the pipe again, for good or for bad. Not, I'm not going to weigh in on the the, yeah. the ethics of that, but it is it just is what it is in today's world. And to your point, influence is influence, right? Doesn't really matter. We've got some ki- we've got parents who are running some YouTube channels with very young kids who are, are like unboxing toys and testing out different experiences and giving their feedback on things like cartoons and movies and all sorts of interesting things. So it feels that value chain is skewing younger and younger yeah. when they start having an outsized impact on the cultural zeitgeist of humanity. Also today, we're actually being asked by our brands a lot more like, there's like almost two two ways people are are leveraging influencers and influence marketing. So one is the influence that they have. The other is just for content creation. And it's being lumped into influence marketing, but as you said, it's just UGC and they don't care. So now the kids today are better at producing content than anyone like my age and they'll do it cheap they'll do it quick they'll do it on time they'll do it make it relevant they might make it funny and so actually it's interesting to hear these brands we've almost come from like sponsorship which is as you said like a a jordan to influencer marketing which is less social to hey can we just get people who'll give us content to use and we don't even care about their influence and so it's interesting, the need, and it, but I think it flexes up and down because then you'll have enough content and then you're like, okay, now we need, and that's the thing with marketing, like you have enough content, it's okay, but where's the acquisition? And then you get acquisition, you're like, I need to keep these people relevant and like interested, so I need content. So it's, it, but it is interesting to hear that they're like, got some runs who are like, we don't even care who they are as long as they produce good content. And that's almost like the opposite of sponsorship, but there you are. Yes, yes, where you typically with sponsorship, you want to sit underneath their umbrella. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And so when we think about the, if I was to, if I was a, let's say I'm an e-commerce brand today and I've got some money set aside for influencer slash sponsorship based marketing and I sign up uh, to your platform for the very first time, what's my user experience as a brand going to be? Is it a white glove onboarding service that I'm going to be assigned an account manager or is it completely self-serve or is it a combination of two depending on how much you want to spend or how like how would I get onboarded into your technology platform and how many influencers or sports stars do you have signed up on the other side because effectively you're a place mediated by technology but also mediated by the human touch so it's an interesting it's a tech enabled influencer marketing marketplace for lack of a better term. (laughs) So controversially, I don't know, we got rid of our self-serve option literally a few months ago. And one of the reasons why is we, the experience you have with us is obviously also to do with the experience you have with our user side. And athletes and agents and influencers and anyone can be unpredictable And so we realized the need to handhold a little bit more in between or create a bit more. And I think, again, we've seen this quite a lot where there was like 
e-lances and the o-desks and people were like yeah but the quality is rubbish so we're still going to go back to a headhunter or whatever else and we now so if you sign up to open sponsorship it's like the beauty is the transparency. You can see pricing, you can see social listening. So we have 17,000 athletes. You can wow. literally look, you can search by engagement, who's on TikTok, who's on YouTube, who's got a female demographic, who's living in Ohio, whatever it may be. So you've got the transparency, you've got all the tools, you trust us for that. But then what we basically do is turn around to you and say, let us manage it for you. And nine out of 10 people go, yes, please. Maybe one out of 10 is, I want to do it myself. Nine out of 10 people are like, absolutely. Yes, please. Because actually this is really fun, but I've got a million things in my inbox. And if you can help me out, that'd be great. And so what we do is I kick off call. We get to know you. We essentially act as an extension of your team. And essentially that's where what you said, like we've got athletes, but we go beyond that because maybe you're like, actually this time I want a yoga instructor and this time I want a mommy blogger or whatever else. And then we do curation recommendations based on previous deals and everything else, contracts, negotiation, payments, and then the deal management, which includes like writing creative briefs. So it's very much evolved from just the match. And do you see a world in the future where I'm not saying somebody, I'm not saying me, but somebody like me, let's say I'm a B2B influencer. Let's say I'm well known in my industry. I'm not a sports person. I'm not a music star, but I'm well known in my industry. And maybe I've got, I don't know, maybe I got a hundred thousand followers on LinkedIn or something like that, where I can influence business buying decisions as opposed to maybe retail goods or something like that. Do you see a world in the future where B2B influencers and industry leaders start to put themselves out there as a potential partnership opportunity with some of these bigger brands that I'm thinking of, if I'm a software, you know, let's say I'm a SaaS software vendor, or I'm a zero, or I'm, I, yeah. I know that when we think of Salesforce with their annual conferences, they get keynote speakers in, then they pay them like $100,000 or they pay Gary Vee to come in and be yeah. a, a keynote speaker yeah. at their conference. And so these types of business influencers seem, and we even look at, yes, the Kardashians are famous for just being famous, but they're also now famous as business people and as influencers mm -hmm. in the business world as well. And we think of some of these successful people that have transitioned from being popular for uh, music or acting or something like that. And they've transitioned into being entrepreneurs. And so that's what they're maybe now more known for, known for than their artistic endeavors. Do you see a future where B2B influencers are a thing? 100%. Yeah. We're already at the very macro level. It's always good to see because if it's happening at the macro, it'll feed down. We've had brands ask us to do deals with Mark Cuban just because recently we're working with someone in real estate space and they were like, asking if we had connections to like Barbara Corcoran. So I would definitely say it is becoming a thing. Again, because ultimately I'm in marketing. I have two things. I only want, I want new customers, so new audiences, and I want storytelling to my existing and new. And so that could be the entrepreneur, right? And we see it actually, interestingly, I'm sure you've seen like the ads for Wix or Shopify and they talk about businesses and stuff like yeah. that. So you're already seeing it. I think you think, oh, it's not, it, it's, it, it sounds like a case study, but it's essentially influence marketing, but with a business. Yes, yes. And they're paying them as an influencer. They're paying them. I'm yeah. thinking like, for example, if I was working in the real estate space and I could have access to Ryan Serhant, for example, he's an influencer in the real estate space yeah. and he's well known he's had his own tv show all that sort of stuff but he's a business influencer in that regard he's not a sports saying? person he's not a music person if i was working in that space or if i felt like he had access to a demographic that i wanted to be influenced that i was selling into then he would be a great he'd be a great spokesperson or he would be a great per we know he knows how to create content he would be able to make great content for us so to speak yeah i guess we we look at uh, ryan reynolds he's a classic He's a classic example of that with Mint Mobile and Aviation Gen and everything else. So I definitely yeah. feel like the business influencer is maybe the next generation of influencer. That's how it feels. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Wow, it's an exciting space to be in. And what's next for you guys? Is there anything today that 
your clients are asking for that you don't yet do or a space you don't play in yet? Or is there anything you look out over the next 18 to 24 months? Are there gaps in the market that you've already identified and said, hey, we don't play here yet, but give us 18 months and we will? Yeah, I think our big focus is on client success. And so it's all about, because ultimately that's how you win more budget. That's how you improve retention, your NPS scores and everything else. And so ultimately what is success? Bottom line revenue sales, right? B2B or B2C, it doesn't matter, right? Wholesale or whatever else, right? You're looking for sales. And so I would say our biggest challenge is how do we improve the ROAS? And so big thing that we're thinking about is like affiliate and the play with affiliate, like in an ideal world, every single one of our athletes would do affiliate deals and then brands would pay quite a hefty affiliate. We take a cut and it would be such a win because it's if you didn't influence, you don't make much money. But obviously the problem is like sponsorship isn't set up like that. Influencer marketing is often not set up like that. And so it's how do we get aligned so that brands aren't spending money and just hoping for the best? Like, what can we do to take the guesswork out, take the unpredictability out? Because also the big thing there is then you're perpetually stuck in getting smaller budgets because people are like, I'll give you a small budget to test it. And it's it's not really like Facebook where 2K will give you X and therefore you can scale up. This is the kind of thing where it's a bit like, there are just certain things in life trying to think of an analogy, like maybe like houses, like a more expensive house just does give you more utility than a small house. It's not like a buy. If you can't afford it, you go for it. And so it's like, how do we get our brands doing bigger deals, spending more money because they will see the return versus doing a small deal and going, we didn't return. So we're not going to go up. No partnerships for most brands, they would say we have an unlimited budget for that. In a way, it's, we yeah. will, however much you can drive, we're going to, we're going to give you that 10% or whatever it is. We're going to give you the same cut that we would give to meta or to Google or whatever. We'll give you that same percentage cut. It's a pay for performance type of engagement. Exactly. Right? And so, Which, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, 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 your goals are perfectly aligned. The more I can help you sell, the more money I make, the more money you make. Everybody's a winner. And yeah. the more you get to clip the ticket. Which I would love to do those deals, but then my supply side has to do them. My athletes and agents have to agree to do them. And that's what they're not doing at the moment, which is what we have to. So if I could, that's the thing I'd fix where there would be some level of like comfort or we could predict, we could almost in an ideal world, like we would be able to be like, we guarantee it because we've looked at your metrics and we think, so I'm not, we're not there yet. It's a combination of data, time, education, focus, educate, exactly. A few things need to happen, but I'd say that's where I'd love to be because I would love to be getting that. I'd love to hear clients go, we can give you unlimited budgets and we actually make money out of it. I guess that's cool because it almost becomes like Google's pay-per-click model, right? It's mm-hmm. it's it, in a way it's but it's pay for conversion model, which is even better. And so at the end of the day, I guess it it, it brings into a line, it brings into closer alignment as opposed to it's almost like what I think with salespeople, like base plus commission. I almost feel if we could come to that kind of referral model, may may basically okay we're gonna pay you a flat fee for the production of the content like just to cover your time and your investment of actually creating the content but uh, the commission is the referral por- portion of it too so maybe we have to move to a little bit more of a hybrid model like your t- typical commission salesperson would be which is base plus base plus some sort of referral fee for every dollar in sales that you drive super interesting concept and what do you think in terms of other influencer pockets of influencers that you see yourself wanting to move into that maybe because i know you already work with music stars you've worked with sports stars you work with with some other verticals as well what other types of influencers would you like to be working with that maybe don't even necessarily see themselves as influencers yet to be honest like going back to that earlier point it's literally who can move the needle so in, in that vein you could argue that does youth move the needle more because maybe they're more open to doing the pay for play deal. Do entrepreneurs move the needle more because they're trusted? And so I think it's, again, I, I would say I'm not so bothered about who, what, like the who. It's more like the, what's the outcome? That obviously, as a business owner myself, like revenue is everything. And it's business impact you know, that they can create, right? Yeah, exactly. Because I, I love speaking to clients who are like, it worked. You worked. Because, you know, so much of marketing is, okay, I tried it. I don't really know if it worked. 
it felt good or it didn't feel good. I liked them or I didn't like them. It's so this. And so, and you know, even like Facebook, like, of course they give you the numbers, but oftentimes you're like, did, did it move the needle or you just can't all the customers I already have? Like what's well, going on here? Well, five different platforms claim. Yeah, what, what exactly. They, that they all drive. They're, yeah. they're all going to get, they're all going to claim the conversion, right? Exactly. So it is really nice to hear clients go, it worked for whatever. A lot of what our clients are doing right now is they're taking the content from the athlete who posts it and they're using it in their paid ads. And that is really driving results. Because, and that is measurable, right? Because you can see, does this ad perform better than the other ads? A lot of people are also using this content in like email marketing. Because like email marketing, it's a big thing. But you have to think of content and it has to be relevant and timely and trendy great, let's use these, let's use these deals we're doing. So these kind of things are working. So I love hearing when our clients say it works. And when I think about the future of the business, it's honestly just all for that, which is like, how do we get results? Because if they get results, they say they love us, they stay with us, they give us more money and everything just feels really good. And you've been doing this for almost 10 years now. So it's definitely not yeah. your first rodeo. What do you wish you knew 10 years ago that now, how, if you were starting from scratch today to build what you've built from scratch again, what do you wish you knew then that you now? There's a million and one things, to be honest, over 10 years. But I'd say at first, I think one of the things that's kept really come to the fore for us, like we've got some profitability milestones we're trying to hit and it has really focused us. And I think we used to have, again, like go back to self-service. We used to have a self-service line item, a full service line item. And then we also do deals with revenue. And then we've got this and then we've got that. And I think it's funny because obviously a lot of about, I, I love reading like self-help stuff and personal growth stuff. And a lot of it is about simplify your life, declutter. And we all know that. I think it's the same in business, like declutter and simplify. I, I think again, tech, tech was like a blessing and a curse, but like, in a way, it really didn't simplify things because you're like, oh, I could put up a landing page and I can do this and I can do that and I can translate into 50 languages and maybe we could go international and maybe we could do this. And I think it took me a moment to really go, what do I need to achieve? And let's not, over just because we can do it doesn't mean we should. And what kind of revenues do you think or that you're seeing from the hard evidence and data that a brand needs to be doing before they can afford some of these kinds of influencer engagements? Do they need to be doing $10 million a year in revs, $50 million a year in revs? What kind of revenue levels do most brands need to be at before influencer marketing like this starts to make sense for them? Good question. I'd say... I would say you probably need it from the beginning, but you don't need to use someone like us. That's a bit more expensive an influencer. I think you you can use like a cheaper platform to get UGC and validation because ultimately like from the beginning, you need people creating a bit of a buzz saying it works and also giving you the feedback. If you send your product to three people and they don't like it, they don't like the taste of it or they don't know how to use it or they're a bit complicated, it's probably not them. It's probably you need to look at your business too. And so I almost find like going back to the applications of influencer marketing, one of them is it's like the cheapest form of word of mouth marketing and the cheapest form of feedback, right? And testimonials. And so like, how are they saying your product's name? If you're like, oh, they said it wrong. Maybe your company name is a bit complicated. Like, you, you know what I mean? So I feel like from the beginning, having said that, we say a good budget to have is around 5K a month. Okay. And there's lots of brands that are spending way more than that on Meta and Google and all the other digital marketing channels that they're across. So really that's not, so about 5K a month from a budget would at a point where your platform and your influencers start to make. Yeah, I would say to get some UGC, to have a bit of influence on their channel, to move the needle that you're not like, five people saw it, I'd say 5K. You can go cheaper. Like we do, we've got brands who do product only deals. The The problem is, does it, and we charge 2K a month as a management fee, just shy of that as a management fee. So it's not really worth it unless you're spending a little bit more on top. And I think like what you said, like 
you want to be able to be investing that influencer across other channels. So if you're doing a bit of paid, you can use this content in paid. If you're doing a bit of PR, you can use these athlete names in PR. If you're doing email marketing, you can use it there. And so I think that's also a big factor, which is you could spend $500 if you're going to really amplify. You get one piece and you really amplify. But if you're relying on it to generate some move the needle stuff, probably 5K. Makes sense. And how has AI impacted your industry or how do you think it will impact your industry? Because we have AI avatars, we've got digital digital only yeah. influencers now with million person followings on Instagram. We've got the bot problem. We've got you know, click farms. We've got so many challenges out there in the digital analytics side. And I'm seeing it even in my world where I've signed up to HeyGen and I now translate all of my podcasts into Spanish as well. And it does the face sync, it does the voice sync, it does the lip sync. It literally looks like me and my guests are speaking fluent Spanish. It's undetectable. You cannot tell that we're not speaking Spanish natively. So there's some interesting places where Gen AI is starting to really impact lots of our industry at every level from the content creation side to the digital avatar side to the fake influence side and bots and there's just there's so many things but wh where do you think ai is starting to impact you and your space and how do you see it influencing both good and bad how do you see it influ influencing our space over the next say 24 months yeah i think it's i love talking about this stuff because we were, it's funny, in 2016 or 17, we were on the homepage of IBM.com. Not that anyone goes to the homepage of IBM.com, but we were on the homepage because they had released IBM Watson. Yes. And we we were using it and it was like, sports company using AI to do this. And I remember my engineers were like, it's not really AI. It's more like just social, like data crunching like in the background anyway machine learning so got, yeah, yeah exactly and so it was always really funny because obviously ai has been around forever and now it's like finding its day right and so i would say with every technology it actually should be applied to a need and i think so often again going back to my point so often it's here's the technology how do we use it and my co-founder i have to give him massive amounts of credit is really good because i'll turn around because i'm the entrepreneur and i'll be like right, come on what we're doing what we're doing and he's what's your problem and i'm like i don't know why do i need a problem i want to use this so at the moment we're really trying to find it to, to so it's obviously making our team more efficient yes. so right personally i think it's got a lot of use cases a little bit like the slack model everyone's yes. using it like individually or venmo individually and then it became a corporate thing so i feel like that's where it's at, at the moment on a company level we do challenge our engineers to say use ai when you can and a great example of this is like getting athletes and agents to keep their profiles up to date is a massive pain in the ass and a lot of times they move teams they move city and they retire they graduate from college and things don't get updated and then it makes us look bad so we're currently using uh, chat gpt to try and improve profiles yes so that's like an example of we have a need right let's do that so i think frankly we're trying to stick to what's the need and where can we use it versus i have definitely come into meetings and gone should we create ai athlete influencers and they're like why now back to my earlier point if we could do that to deliver roi and do paper play affiliate deals with ai influencers that's really exciting but the other thing what you have to be really careful about especially because we're a small company is it can be a distraction and not actually yield yeah. and next thing you turn around six months later and you're like shit we just invested loads we've done that with our engineers where we're like we invested loads of money into something and it didn't work for what yeah whereas like so I think it's a very interesting, it's, it's almost sad because I wish we could do more, but I don't want to get distracted and waste time. And maybe it's, there is the tyranny of constraint, right? And there, th that is, some, as you say, sometimes it's a very good thing that you can't do everything and you can't chase every shiny object. It forces a level of focus and it forces a level of niching down that is oftentimes very good for a business to have to function under because sometimes it's, especially it's it becomes more important what you say no to than what you say yes to and and that that because that's a skill in itself as a business leader and me as a as an independent consultancy i'm not 
I'm not EY. I'm not BCG. And so therefore, I don't have those resources, but it forces me to operate in a very narrow niche that I see as blue ocean because there's yeah. bit, hardly any people playing there. And so that has made my business more sustainable uh, ultimately because of those constraints that were put upon me by the market. And I've been able to innovate within my tiny little niche. I've been able to innovate within there really strongly because there's nobody playing in this tight little niche. And I think that everybody says you want to have the biggest top of the funnel you can possibly have. So you want to try to be all things to all people. But I actually see it another way because if you're trying to be all things to all people, which is impossible anyway, right, you're automatically operating in a red ocean space where everybody else is trying to be all things to all people. And so mm. I think niching down is definitely a superpower. And it sounds like you've been able to accomplish that. Maybe it was forced upon you. Maybe it was circumstantial, but it's been, you've been able to innovate within your space because of that, because you were trying to do something that was so unique, so special and so niche. So congratulations on being able to hit it out of the park in that regard. Now, if people want to get a hold of you, if they want to learn more, I'll drop your link to your LinkedIn profile into the show notes, as well as your website link into the show notes. But other than that, how do you like people to get a hold of you and talk all things, influencer, sports marketing, PR, digital influencers, all that sort of stuff? Yeah, no, I think I would say like LinkedIn is the best if it's me personally, or if you just want to shoot the shit with our like company, then definitely like come in through Intercom and give us your idea and we'll, we'll route you to the right person. Amazing. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Now, as we come down to the end of our time together, this is where I get to flip the script. I get to hand the microphone over to you. I get to let you ask me one question. Any question you like can be personal or professional. Ishveen Jolly, what is your question for me today? Mm -hmm. I would say... What is something that you are hoping to achieve before the end of the year? Before the end of the year. Wow, that's a very good that's a very good question. We I'm part of the B2B EA, the B2B e-commerce association. I'm I'm a member and I work heavily in the B2B space. And so this is we're trying to figure out what the market needs and trying to deliver it to them outside of just me and the other few select people that are very well known in the B2B e-commerce space, we're trying to figure out what the industry needs to excel. And we're trying to get that down on paper and we're actually trying to put not only the corporate structure in place to be able to support that, but also the tools and we're putting together an academy, uh, a training academy within the B2BA underneath that umbrella. And so I would, by the end of the year, if we can have clarity on that and we can actually start delivering some massive value to our industry and help them level up, because everything we're doing, it's about helping, because we all believe, all the people that are members of B2B EA and, and especially the leadership within the B2B EA, we believe a rising tide floats all boats. And we all recognize that the B2B, digital B2B world is where B2C and D2C was a decade ago. And so we, there's a lot of immaturity out there. There's a significant amount of manufacturers, wholesalers, and distributors that don't have any digital presence at all, apart from maybe a brochure website. And so this is a real problem. It's a real challenge and it's a massive opportunity. So if we can have that nutted out by the end of the year, where the value that we bring as an industry body to the market is crystal clear and our mandate of what we need to deliver to help support these businesses, vendors, consultants, agencies, if we can get super clear on that by the end of the year, I'll feel like we've accomplished something great. Nice. Good luck. Thank you very much. Listen, really appreciate your time. Can't wait to speak to you again soon. And I wish you all the best with all of your endeavors and helping democratize access to all of these incredible influencers throughout the world. If you'd like to get mentored by Jason for free, head over to greenwoodconsulting.net, scroll to the bottom of the page and click Get Mentored by Jason.